You're watching No More News. I'm Adam Green with No More News. It's October 10th, 2017. I'm here in Laguna Beach with Christopher Bolin, investigative researcher and author of the great 9-11 books, Solving 9-11, The Deception That Changed the World, and your new book, The War on Terror, The Plot to Rule the Middle East. And you've been on a book tour. This is the last stop of your West, West Coast. Coast tour. Mm -hmm. So tell us how the tour has been going. It's gone very well. It's uh, really important to uh, uh, tour the country and see the people that are involved in 9-11 Truth on a really active level. And the people that you've been seeing up, up and down the West Coast, how have the crowds been? How has the feedback been? Very, very good. Um, you know, even in places like Santa Cruz where there was a lot of resistance, mm -hmm. we had a fantastic event on the beach with about 70 people sitting on the uh, eucalyptus logs. And why were you on the beach? Well, two venues got pulled on us. The local rabbi and uh, a supervisor from the county uh, took uh, offense or umbrage with our presentation and, uh, and pulled the events. So with only two or three hours before the final event, we, um, we were relocated to the beach. Free speech on the beach. Free speech. Yeah. And is there much like press coverage of any of these canceled events? Well, there's often press coverage like in Ashland, Oregon, uh, preceding the event, the, in which they um, warn the citizens of an uh, anti-Semitic far-right speaker coming to town. And, uh, you know, and then the, the local rabbi there, who my understanding is has connections to Israeli intelligence, he got his congregation, some of his congregation, to come out and protest us. But um, there's been a lot of pushback from the people in, in Ashland who are supporters of the truth. Oh, yeah? What, what was the pushback? that you're speaking of? Well, I mean, the, the, the rabbi came up on the stage and actually threatened me. And uh, the police took him away. What did he say? Well, he came at me in a, in a menacing way. He, he, I was giving my presentation, and he walked up on the stage and came, you know, a few feet within me, and I had to back up. But the... Um, and the, this, this is Rabbi Joshua Bodiger? No, this is Zaslau. Zaslau, that, that's different. Z uh, Zaslau, Z-A-S-L-O-W. I think his name is David. David Zaslau in um, Ashland, Oregon. So they, uh, there was, how many protest protesters would you say was there in Ashland? Well, there were a good dozen in the, in the crowd and they tried to disrupt the uh, event with their you know, interjections, playing yeah. music, um, pulling my books off the table. But as the truth came out more and more, they got- um, They were listening. Disgusted, yeah, but they, they left. They left, so it was like, a, it was one by one, um, the dissenters left until you know um, they were gone, but they were they were they were trying to shut down the event. Mm -hmm. And then in Seattle and in um, some other places, there's been a police presence, but the police presence has been very supportive. Really? Oh yeah. Yeah, I imagine they would be. Seattle, Portland, San Francisco. I have the article here from the Ashland Daily Tidings, and the, the headline was Anti-Semitic Talk at Library Draws Protesters. I love how it's not a 9-11 truth talk. Right. It's an anti-Semitic talk. So right. I wonder if this headline gives any indication if the article is going to be biased. Right. So let me start with the first paragraph. I'm just here to let you know this man is an anti-Semitic and a Holocaust denier sponsored by hate groups. Are, are you sponsored by hate groups? I'm sponsored by myself and, and a few donors, no hate groups involved. Yeah. And this is Alex Budd. He told the group of about 35 people who came and went. Funny how they write it like that. They came and they went. That was it. No big deal. Mm -hmm. Their lives weren't changed, which <laughs> I saw your presentation in San Diego mm -hmm. two days ago, and it was incredible. Just everything was fact-based. It was just so much evidence. And they're just going to scream anti-Semitic over and over again, huh? So during your talk, Bud interrupted to speak out about the anti-Semitism being propagated. So the people were like yelling stuff out during your speech. What, what were they yelling? In Ashland? Yeah. Well, they were making noise and they were disrupting, you know, basically disrupting. And it says he was booed and shouted out by some of the attendants. So people had your back kind of and were... Yeah, the people that wanted to hear the event, they, they came to hear the truth, wanted to know about the 9-11. You know, they, they, you know, said enough of this nonsense. And like, go away, mm -hmm. because it became it became you know offensive. They were, they were just like, it was like the Brooklyn mob. It was an organized, concerted effort to shut down the event, mm -hmm. and the people got you know, well put off by it. 
Yeah, I would. That people drive, you know, probably sure. an hour sure. out of the way to come see you, and people are interrupting. And it's not fair. It's not. It's it's anti free speech. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got the venue. We're giving a speech. We're giving the speeches for people who are interested in the subject. If, if you want to hear about nine eleven truth and the war on terror, that's a subject. And these people come from out of the out of the woodwork and and try to disrupt an event. It's not fair. It says. Uh, that the guy that interrupted was booed and shouted out by some in attendance and, and eventually asked to leave by library security. And then later others in the crowd also spoke out and left as well. It kind of, the, the way they write that, it makes it seem like just people that were not there with the protesters decided to leave also. It's just such right. a joke. Right. And then here's another quote. Perpet perpetuating the idea that any one group is responsible for the suffering in the world, it's dangerous, Bud said. It creates an immediate attitude of suspicion and it gets people killed. Well, wait, we're talking about a specific crime. Mm -hmm. We're talking about 9-11 and the war on terror. We're not talking about all the evils in the world. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about 9-11 and the war on terror, these things are connected. They're married at the hip. And identifying the source of this uh, deception is important to uh, reclaiming our history. And you're not blaming all Jews for 9-11 either, of by any means. Of course not. Yeah. Of course not. Yeah. Not even all Zionists. You know, you have to be very careful about your language. And I never paint with such a broad brush. Uh, what we're talking about is a few individuals and an organization behind it um, that is uh, involved in the, in the plotting and the carrying out and the cover-up. And you document it very well in your books. I mean, it's really open and shut case, really. Nobody wants to argue any of the facts that you talk right. about. It's just anti-Semitic. That's the only thing they can talk about. Right. And, and likewise with the, war, with the war on terror, you know, you have a, a specific group of people who are behind the, um, the propagation, the promotion of the war, and the cover-up of the truth. And it says that they had a cross town. There was another rally held to, like, kind of as an alternative event, they say, yeah. for peace and love. Yeah. So they're peace that, and love, and you're just hate and death, I guess. That was the plot, but that, that alternative event did not happen. It didn't happen. Nobody no. shut up. Yeah. No, it did not happen. Mm. But it made it in the article, so according right. to the news, it right. happened. Right, right. And they don't want to give energy to voices of anti-Semitics, but instead focus on conversation about the rise of hate speech and actions across the country. I just saw your presentation. There's no hate speech. It's nothing but their own words, their own documents, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. historical facts, clips of them on TV. I mean, mm -hmm. there's nothing hateful about it. Mm -hmm. This article makes me sick. Oh. And it says, uh, Bolin is on tour promoting his writing and opinions. That's all you, that's all you have are opinions. No, nothing fact-based. Right. Well, that, the important thing about that is to understand that my research is fact-based, and the conclusions are based on the facts. It's all logical. There's no opinion um, inserted. And you just wrapped up your California tour. You were kicked out in Santa Cruz. So they end with your one. I'm sure you talked to them a whole lot about a lot of stuff, but they just they quote you that oh you were kicked out of another tour. So this is just like you know part. We and weren't we weren't kicked out. The rabbi of Aptos mm -hmm. and a county supervisor who is Jewish contacted the venue, the Grange Hall, first in Live Oak, Santa Cruz, and then in Aptos, which is just outside of Santa Cruz, and threatened them. And, and from my, what, I, what I saw from the threat from the rabbi of Aptos was that it went something like this. I'm the rabbi of Aptos. I have a thousand members in my congregation. And if you go ahead with this, with this event, there will be consequences. Oh, so a threat, an open threat. It was threat. a very, it, yeah, a very clear threat. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> Okay, so enough of Ashland. You're getting okay. your the venues are kicking you out. You're being harassed and threatened by yeah. rabbis, by peaceful, loving rabbis. Right. This is just kind of buried. Right. Yeah. No. I am so angry now because I, I, no. I don't know where to play. I'll give this guy. I'm open minded. I'll give this guy a play. I want to see what evidence he has and how he presents it. What he's got to say. If you want to see what evidence he has, that you and I are responsible for the attack. Go away. Go back inside. Whatever evidence he has, that you and I. Nazis! Nazi scum! They trespassed. They tried to steal my fucking phone! What? You're on the street what? now. You can't touch what? me. What? You're on the street. You can't touch me. That's right. And if you do, I'm here. I'm fucking here. That's Where's right. the leader of the alternative media to ex give exposure to this story? Which one? I don't know. Who, who do you think is the leader of the alternative movement? Well, you know, if you, if you refer to Alex Jones, for example, um, I'll be going to Texas soon. I'll be speaking in Austin. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, he'll be invited as he has been for the previous two or three events I've done in Austin, Texas, and he has never shown up. And I recently did a video, Alex Jones snubs top 9-11 researcher. Just, yeah. There's no way he could be serious about 9-11 when he ignores not only your work, but your tour. Right. Okay, so your books, let's do a real quick, quick review of your book, Solving 9-11. Okay. Solving 9-11 is a set of two books, really. Uh, there's The Mother Load, the original articles, and then The Deception That Changed the World. And it contains my analysis of 9-11, my investigative research, that pins the tail on the donkey. Uh, who was behind 9-11 and why they did it. And I've read it multiple times. I have a few copies. I've handed it out. Oh, good. And it's beyond reasonable doubt. You've read it a couple times. A couple times. That's very good. Yeah. That's necessary. You have to. Yeah, you do. Because there's do. so much facts in here that to really learn all the names and yeah. remember the whole the whole plot, it's it takes some, some research. That's right. So... And you didn't just pick up on 9-11, you were in New York on 9-11, but mm -hmm. you had been studying Zionism and Israeli-Palestine right. conflict. So right. Tell me about that, your history of research. In right. This. Well, um, having lived in the Middle East in the mid-70s until like 1980 or so, I was, I was living in Israel and Palestine and, and the Middle East when um, this Likud party came to power. And I was living in a Zionist community, a kibbutz. And um, I came back to America when I was 21 years old and saw how in this country the understanding and the presentation of uh, Israel and Zionism was extremely distorted. So that it meant that the American people were getting a very uh, misleading understanding of the Middle East. And then, of course, the wars happened. I mean, there, there was a war in 82. I mean, I've been studying this for a long time. But the war in 82 in Lebanon was a very crucial event, a very central event to understanding the Zionist plot. And I saw, understanding that, they, that we were not being given the truth, I watched how things were being omitted from mainstream re reporting. And uh, when 9-11 happened, with my antenna up, mm -hmm. I looked for um, you know, distortion and misrepresentation and omission of important evidence. And lo and behold, that's what happened from day one. And, and that makes it very easy for an investigative reporter like myself because you see um, what they're omitting from the mainstream reporting is often the most important stuff. Having all your experience studying the Zionists before 9-11, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you, you, and you come to America being an American, you yeah. can see all the omissions as a huge yeah. void that you could fill with your reporting. Yeah, well, exactly. And, and, and you can see that what's being What's being omitted is often, and usually, of course, the most important stuff. And there's a reason why it's being omitted. So what brought you to Israel in the first place, though? Well, I, you know, I finished high school in Illinois and wanted to go traveling around and uh, went back to Europe. I'd been in Europe before, and I wanted to see more of the world. So I wound up yeah, being in, in traveling across, you know, on the route to Kashmir, as it was in the day, you know, there was the, the, the trip to make across northern India and Afghanistan. But I only got so far as Tehran, and um, it got cold, snowy, and not very friendly. And I was in, I was had an offer, an opportunity to go down to uh, work in Israel. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that sounds better. You know, picking oranges is better than being in the snow in Tehran. So I went down to back through Syria and Turkey and Jordan, and I I wound up on a kibbutz in Israel. What's a kibbutz? A kibbutz is a basically a communist. Israeli Zionist collective because uh, communism and Zionism come from the same place and so the uh, communist party that went to Israel created these communist settlements. It's like a commune? Kind it's of? a commune. commune it's, a commune. it's a commune but it's a, a militarized commune if yeah. you will. It's got barbed wire fences and machine guns and, and it was a settlement. And, but it's Zionist. It's Zionist with a capital Z. So I learned about Zionism from the guys who built the country. Interesting. Gives you the perfect perspective to Yeah, really important. I mean, they're quite honest, you know. Yeah. They're quite honest, these old guys. Okay. All right, and then your new book that you're on the tour for, the, the War on Terror? Yeah, The War on Terror, The Plot to Rule the Middle East, is like the final chapter of this Solving 9-11 stuff because it explains why 9-11 was done. 9/11 did, did you know? 9/11 did not drop out of the out of the blue sky. 
September 11th happened in order to make the war on terror real. And, and Americans have to understand that because this war, the war on terror, is now 16 years old, America's longest foreign war and most expensive. And it's, it's destructive to this nation. And, and American people don't understand it. What troubles me is that there is no resistance to the war, which is what I'm trying to, in, you know, instill in the people that there needs, they, people have, we have to resist this. We have to understand that this is a deception and we have to resist it. You used a metaphor in your presentation the other day that if uh, the war on terror is an arch, that the top piece was 9-11. And yeah. I thought it was a great metaphor. A keystone. Keystone. The keystone. 9-11 yeah. was the keystone that holds the arch up. And the arch is the war on terror construct. Yeah. Great. So these are definitely books that everybody needs to read. Yeah. And also from your presentation, some of the highlights, stuff that I hadn't really thought so deep about before that were really uh, had an impact was the the phrase, the act of war. Yeah. How they, can you talk about that? Yeah. Well, when 9-11 happened, it was a, an act of mass murder and terrorism. But the, the Bush administration declared it to be an act of war on day one which changed the uh, investigation from being a criminal investigation to being a non-investigation. So rather than investigate the crime, look at the evidence, uh, you know, prosecute the guilty in a court of law, they simply said the president has the right to decide where we will, we will seek revenge based on his determination of who's guilty. And they passed that, it was an authorization for war, and they keep uh, yeah. repassing it's it every year. authorization for the use of military force. Right. And it was passed shortly after 9-11, and it gave the president sole responsibility for determining res guilt and, and achieving vengeance. And that's very bad, because that's very dangerous, because it gives, you know, George Bush or Barack Obama, or in this case, Donald Trump, it gives them sole authority to determine where they will go to war, what they will do, um, without any congressional intervention at all, without any, without any need to prove their case. They simply go to war and, and insert troops here and there. I just learned the other day that there were U.S. troops who had been killed in the Central African country of Niger. I had no idea that U.S. Special Forces were operating in Niger, but it's all part of the war on terror. And when you said that in the presentation, it's an act of war, I, I, you, you have a slide where you put up, it's the New York Times headline, mm -hmm. act of war, real big. USA Today. USA Today. Mm -hmm. And I remember Richard Pearl, I believe on BBC, and the first question posed to him, was this an act of war? Mr. Pearl, people have been talking about this today as an act of war. Is that how you see it? Uh, clearly, it's an act of war, uh, both in terms of its magnitude and its purpose. 9-11 changed everything. Before 9-11, we tended to think in terms of um, a terrorist act as a criminal enterprise. Um, and the appropriate response was a law enforcement response. You go find the bad guy, put him in jail, case closed. It's very important we make that transition to understanding that we're at war, that uh, the war continues, that this is a global enemy. On September the 11th, enemies of freedom committed an act of war against our country. But now that war has been declared on us, we will lead the world to victory. That was the talking point that they yep. were going with. And then you uh, link that to Bush saying that it's going to take a long time. That's the thing is that from the very beginning, George Bush, Dick Cheney, and all of his, their, their minions and, and, and Zionist neocon supporters said this war is going to take a long time it's going to be an open-ended conflict. It's going to go on for decades. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. Victory against terrorism will not take place in a single battle, but in a series of decisive actions against terrorist organizations and those who harbor and support them. The American people must understand that we've got a long way to go in order to achieve our objective in this theater. I stand by those words, Afghanistan is still just the beginning. If anybody harbors a terrorist, they're a terrorist. This is going to be a tough battle, and at, at its most fundamental level, to succeed, it will have to go not against only the terrorists themselves, but against the states, the regimes, the terror regimes that make the terror network possible. And I have no doubt that it can muster a global uh, attack, a global attack 
not of defense alone, but of offense, against the terrorist states and the terrorist regimes that they sponsor. Preemptively, All, preemptively. Both preemptive and by diplomatic means, namely rogue states. There are five of them, Iran, Iraq, Libya, North Korea. These kind of states should be treated as rogue states. You have to root out not only the uh, terrorist organizations, but also the regimes that harbor them and give them safe haven. The combined power of the terror network, that includes states like Iran, Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, Syria, the Palestinian enclave, and a few terrorist groups, and a few other regimes in the Middle East. I believe that this is the time to deploy a globally concerted effort led by the United States, the UK, Europe, and Russia against all sources of terror, rogue states like Iran, Iraq, or, or Libya. It's a time to launch a, a operational, concrete war against a, a, a terror. It's also important for people to understand that this is a long-term proposition. It's not like, um, well, even Desert Storm, where we had a build-up for a few months, four days of combat, and it was over with. Uh, this is going to be the, the kind of work that will probably take years because the, the focus has to be not just on one, any one individual. The, the problem here is terrorism. Campaign of terror, if you will, the war on terror that we're engaged in. Um, this is a continuing enterprise. Uh, the, the people that were involved in some of those activities before 9-11 are still out there. Our war on terror begins with al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. Americans are asking, how will we fight and win this war? Now, this war will not be like the war against Iraq a decade ago, with a decisive liberation of territory and a swift conclusion. Our response involves far more than instant retaliation and isolated strikes. Americans should not expect one battle, but a lengthy campaign, unlike any other we have ever seen. Why should it take more than a few weeks to round up some... Uh, the Taliban. You know, yeah, the no. Taliban or, or even Al-Qaeda in the Hindu Kush. It shouldn't take more than a, a couple months. I mean, this is a, the poorest country in Asia. Um, you know, it's a small group. But, but they were preparing the American people for a very open-ended, long, extended campaign mm -hmm. because they knew that was the agenda. Well, they had those huge underground caves, though, that, uh, who was it, Rum, not Rum, Rumsfeld yeah, was yeah, talking about. Yeah. Yeah. No, but they, that, was, that was all, uh, you know, yeah. nonsense. But they knew that the, that the plan, the strategic plan to redraw the map of the Middle East would take a long time. And in order to prepare the American people for a long, extended conflict, they... They, they, they talked, they prognosticated that it would take decades to fight this war. They were, they were preparing the American public for the war we are now in, mm -hmm. the longest war and the most expensive in U.S. history. That's the most important thing, is that this war is, you know, it's not that it's taken millions of lives in our country. You know, they have, they have taken more than a million lives in those countries. But it has, it has bankrupted this country. Yeah, it, is, it is taking the food off of American tables. It is taking the, the prosperity out of our communities. It's, it's, it's enslaving our children and grandchildren to a debt, to a burden of debt, for no American reason, for no cause. It's the military industrial it, so complex siphoning all of our money away. Exactly. Us, yeah. So it's, an, it's a destruction of this country's prosperity. And, you know, it's like um, Netanyahu said, he said that when we're, when we're done with America, after we've drained, every, after we've sucked all the stuff we need out of America, it'll be nothing left. You can blow it away. So Netanyahu is, as, you know, he's working with these Rothschild bankers. This is a, a two-edged sword. One of the edges cuts against us. Netanyahu worked for the Rothschilds, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Boston Consulting. Boston Consulting, yeah. 76, 77, 78. And you also link uh, the act of war, it's going to take a long time to Wesley Clark saying it was a policy coup mm -hmm. and that Americans need to realize that. I thought that was very important. What happened at 9-11 is we didn't have a strategy, we didn't have bipartisan agreement, we didn't have American understanding of it, and we had instead a policy coup in this country. A coup. A policy coup. Some hard-nosed people took over the direction of American policy 
and they never bothered to inform the rest of us. He reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. Well, he said it was a policy coup. He said 9-11 was a policy coup, but he also said that we did not have American understanding of it, in which he was hinting that the understanding that we did have of it was not American. It was. It was Israeli. Yeah. The understanding that the, the interpretation of the event and the uh, uh, setting up of the res response to 9-11 was completely controlled by the Israelis. And, and the, the, the Zionist neocons who um, made policy for the Bush administration. Wolfowitz, Pearl, uh, Dov Zakheim, Zelikow. Douglas Feith, Zelikow. Carl Bernstein was on uh, Morning Joe and saying that all these wars are uh, the Jewish neocons, and he's allowed to say yeah. that because he's Jewish. It's an insane war that brought us low economically, morally. We went to war against a guy who had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11. It was a total pretext. It's, it's inexplicable. And there you go to Cheney, there you go to Bush, there you go to the Jewish neocons, Jewish neocons who wanted to remake uh, the world, who wanted to remake uh, the world. Maybe I can say that because I'm Jewish and uh, to bring about a certain I'm result not really in the Middle sure East. That you can. That there was this grand conspiracy no. of the neocons, and you said Jewish neocons, <laughs> that they somehow went to war on a pretext for the state of Israel. And then just recently we had that woman CIA agent who retweeted that uh, our wars are all Israeli wars and then mm -hmm. she had to apologize and she mm -hmm. lost her job and all mm -hmm. types of stuff. You're not allowed to talk about our wars in the Middle East being for Israeli interests even though it's right on in our face and right. they talk about it all the time. Right. Well that's what this book is all about. Mm -hmm. In this book I show that the war on terror and 9-11 both come from the same place which is fundamentally Israeli military intelligence, um, and this was being promoted and pushed since the late 1970s when Menachem Begin came to power, the arch-terrorist of, of Zionism. So it's like, you know, the Zionists bring you terrorism and war to, to benefit their agenda. What surprise is there? All based off terror, too. What's the quote from uh, Begin? Well, Begin was asked if he was the uh, father of terrorism in the Middle East. Um, in 1974, and he said, in the Middle East, in all the world, in all the world. So he was putting on himself the mantle of being the father of terrorism in the entire world. And he's not off the mark. Not at all. Isn't the Mossad's uh, motto something like war by deception? By deception thou shalt do war. Yeah, says it all right there. Yeah. False flag deception, that's what they're doing. Yeah. And there was an Israeli or an American Canadian operative who worked for the Mossad. He was a, a chief. His name is Ostrovsky. Victor, I think, Victor Ostrovsky. And he wrote a book called By Way of Deception, Line of Judah, and Beyond Deception. Very good books about the Mossad. And he lays it out that the, uh, that the Israeli uh, Mossad's way of doing business is, is deception and they've used it time and time again. Two weeks ago, we did another interview in Laguna Beach which I appreciate, and it's done very well online. It's mm -hmm. got over, as of this morning, it has over 77,000 views, which mm -hmm. is just way beyond my expectations. Mm -hmm. And that's in under two and a half weeks. It's got 489 comments, and it's got a thousand thumbs up to only 95 thumbs down. Okay. So 95 rabid Zionist okay. uh, apologists. 54% of the views are from the United States. 245 people from Saudi Arabia watched oh, really? it. 127 from Israel. Okay. 40 from Kenya, 45 pe from Pakistan. So your message is reaching the whole world. Mm -hmm. There's tons of other videos online that have yeah. even more views. Yeah. Uh, qu quarter million views, right, on some yeah. of them. Just yeah. a small little presentation yeah. that you do like we're about to do right now here. Right. Just incredible. In your books, your your books on Amazon are top 20 in terrorism. That's right. Okay. So both of your books are in the top 20 in uh -huh. terrorism on Amazon. Uh -huh. 
and they both have four and a half stars. Th right. This one's been around since 2012. It's right. gotten hundreds of reviews. This one's just been out for a, a month or so. Yeah, right. Still has four and a half stars. Right. But uh, everybody, if you've read this book and you like it, go comment on, it, comment <laughs> on Amazon because we need to support the truth. Mm -hmm. I think part of the reason that it got a lot of views was you've been kind of there's been a buzz around you this week because uh -huh. there's a, on Kevin Barrett's show there was a critique of you by Barry Kissin. Okay. Do, do you know who Barry Kissin is? I met him in uh, Washington. He was a he's a lawyer, a retired lawyer from Jewish lawyer from Frederick, Maryland. Yeah. And he's a 9/11 truth activist. So they say. So they say. Yeah. Yeah. He's more big on the Saudi 28 pages route, mm -hmm. and, and apparently he's upset with you for his his part of his critique here says that one of your vocal disciples. So. If, uh, if somebody's a vocal disciple, what does that make you? Like Jesus or something? <laughs> but anyway, a vocal disciple was said that the 28 pages was a uh, uh, limited hangout, which just on 9-11 at the NewsBud conference, all the panelists agreed that it was a limited hangout. Right. Although it may be true the funding did come through Pakistan and Saudi Arabia okay. through Bandar Bush, yeah. it's still... Can you talk to how it's an Israeli plot? Well, I mean, you know, the Solving 9-11 research that I've got in these two books, Solving 9-11, The Deception Changed the World, and the original articles, it shows that at every single crucial point of this uh, matrix, you have an Israeli or a, a Zionist supporter of the state of Israel, and particularly the Likud party. Um, the 28 pages, for example, that tried to fix blame on Saudi Arabia, um, refer to a Saudi giving money to a couple of Saudi guys who were then supposedly on flight uh, 77. But th the point is that if there's no evidence that flight 77 hit the Pentagon, if these guys weren't on the plane, then there's, it's a moot point. Mm -hmm. But isn't there surveillance footage of them going through security? No, there's one photograph that's uh, from a video that shows two of these guys going through an airport security um, at some airport, I don't know where it is, I think it was Bangor, Maine, but we, we're not even sure of that. But there's no, otherwise there's no footage or evidence that these guys were on the plane at all, these 19 Arab hijackers. Mm -hmm. And the head of the CIA, Mueller, Mueller, mm -hmm. he said in 2002 that there is absolutely no evidence to prove the identity of hijackers or that these guys were on the plane. So it's like, what are we talking about? If the FBI can't conclude that these people were on the plane, you know. Don't you think it could be a possible scenario that there was like a cell of hijackers who the Mossad was behind and they set them up to be doing a drill or just set them to get somehow got them on the plane and then, you know, had a different hijacker or they well, use remote control or something like that? Well, I mean, that that may have been. But, you know, the the initial uh passenger lists that were released by the uh, media in the very mm -hmm. beginning uh, showed no names of Arab hijackers. And when I contacted American United to ask about this, one of the airlines told me that it was because they hadn't obtained permission from the families of these five hijackers or ten mm -hmm. hijackers. So it's like, no, it's like, you know, we, we, we can't fill in, we can't fill in what we want to fill in. The evidence shows that these guys were not on the plane. The evidence shows that these people had been um, uh, obtained or duplicate identities had been obtained for these people mm -hmm. in Florida. Stolen, many, many stolen. Many of them uh, had many passports. of them had reported lost passports, and then like seven of them were reported by the BBC News as having been alive and well after 9/11. So, in the lead hijacker Mohammed Atta, AP went and interviewed his father in Egypt, and what did he say? Yeah, he was asked like, "Where's your son?" And he, and and the father of Mohammed Atta said. I don't know, ask them Saad. As they fooled federal authorities, they also seem to have fooled their own relatives. The father of hijacker Mohammed Atta expressed disbelief today at his home in Egypt that his son could have been one of the suicide terrorists. There is absolutely no link between my son and Islamic groups. Mohammed, my son, hates Osama bin Laden like he hates the sinner. He was killed, I do not know. But he called me a few days ago after the attack. Do you see me sad? Okay. 
يا اما سرقوا جوه السفر يا اما اتخطفوا صفوه قتلوه وهذا الحادث لا يمكن عقلا لمنظمه صغيره او متوسطه ان تنفذه he said the Mossad did it. They've done this before. Yeah. And he said he spoke to Muhammad Atta the day after, after 9-11. Right, right, right. So it's like, um, you know, this is a deception on a grand scale. So, you know, we, you know, we can only work from uh, what evidence we have and we can confirm. And, it, you know, the evidence indicates that these guys were not on the plane. Not, not, as, not as who they were supposed to be. All right, here is a comment from the interview video that we posted two weeks ago and this mm -hmm. is from i'm not going to give the guy's name i don't want to mm -hmm. give him any uh, okay. publicity here but he goes christopher bullen is a fraud who denies 34 years of rockefeller rockefeller planning behind 9 11 and the involvement of bush cheney rumsfeld in the project of the new american century uh, i think that's funny that you deny the involvement of bush cheney rumsfeld because in your presentation you have a slide that says pnac and you talk all about pnac right. being behind it right and how is pnac I jewish or I israeli they have lots of well, connections pnac was created by um the, uh, the kagan family the kagan family um, from the state department donald kagan his two sons uh, frederick and robert and victoria newland his uh, robert's wife and uh william crystal yeah, Bill and and these people um, created this group, and it was a it was an, an agency for carrying forth the Zionist plan uh, agenda to uh, basically destroy Iraq, mm -hmm. and they've been pushing the uh, attack and destruction of Iraq um, since the 1990s. So it's mm -hmm. like it's a Zionist uh, what do you call it? think tank? Yeah. It's a Zionist think tank, but it's not yeah. doing any thinking. It's, Richard it's, Pearl, it's, I believe. Yeah, There's yeah, tons Richard of Zionists Pearl. in there. Yeah, it's a the Zionist. whole Bush, cap, Bush yeah, cabinet. Yeah, and these people, um, the signatories to this uh, Rebuilding America's Defenses PNAC document from 1990 September, um, you know, they populated the entire Bush administration. And then down here he says, Bush, Cheney, and Rumsfeld are not Jews. Yet 9/11 would never have happened without them. Well, first of all. Um, that second sentence, that 9-11 would not have happened without them, um, I don't understand that because we have no evidence that Bush, Cheney, or Rumsfeld were key movers or, you know, architects or, ma or managers or masterminds of 9-11. They happened to be the people who were in high-level positions, um, but that doesn't mean that they did it. Um, what was the first part of the question? Bush, Cheney, and they're not Jews, but 9-11 oh, yeah. well, wouldn't have happened. Well, they're not Jews, okay, they're not, they're not Jews, but, yeah. you know. You've never said that every person involved no, was Jewish. No, of course Jewish. not, and, and the thing is, is that there are people who are Christians or other religions who are Zionists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your, your religion doesn't make a big difference. Yeah, Joe Biden famously said that mm -hmm. you don't have to be Jewish to be a Zionist, and he's a proud Zionist. Glenn right. Beck says the same thing. When I was a young senator, I'd say, if I were a Jew, I'd be a Zionist. I am a Zionist. You don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. I am a proud Zionist. I am proud to be with you. Right, and we, and, and we have like, you know, I don't know, 40 million Christian Zionists in the United States of America. More than that. Um, these are people who believe that their Christian duty, um, and, you know, obliges them to support the state of Israel. And Alex Jones is one of those. He puts out articles saying that if you don't support Israel, if you don't veto the vote and abstain, to, to veto the UN resolution about the illegal settlements, then God is going to punish us with hurricanes and volcanoes I don't, and tornadoes. I, I, I don't think it's his religion that tells him to do that. No, it's probably the Mossad agent that visited yeah, him. Yeah, probably. He admitted about. Yeah. And then I had this Mossad agent, that, uh, who's one of the top guys in the country, whose cover is writing for a major magazine. And he gets there, and I go, I know this is really a visit from the Mossad. He goes, well, I'm sure, but I'm, hey, well, how'd you know that? I'm not really doing an article. I just want to see what you're planning to do to Israel. And I'm just like, I'm not against Israel. Okay, so this guy goes on. He goes, um, he says it's PNAC, which you agree, mm -hmm. it's PNAC. 9-11 was not born in the mind of Isser Harel in 1979, as claimed. That's, that's your thesis. You've got... Go well, back. I, I don't say that Isser Harel was the grandfather of 9-11. Yeah. He articulated, though. He was the former head of the Mossad, chief, uh, you know, the original founder of the Mossad, first chief, and then Shin Bet. Um, and he, he articulated the 9-11 uh, scenario in 1979 or 1980 to uh, Michael Evans, a, a TV evangelist or a Texas Jewish evangelist, um, 
who he who, who met him, who was a, you know a very big Zionist. Um, but his art, his the fact that he articulated this and this is brought to the public's attention after 9/11 shows that Israeli military intelligence um, had had this idea in their head 22 years before 9/11 happened, and they're predicting it. They're making movies about it. They're, you know, projecting it into the public mind. Yeah. Arnon Milkan made the movie Medusa Touch in yeah. 1978. 78. And he was a Mossad agent at that time. He admits. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. So it was like it was going through their mind at the time in the late 1970s, and they prepared for the uh, attacks to go on in the 1980s. They yeah. actually ma set the groundwork for the attacks. And Bush Sr. attended the Jerusalem Confer Conference and spoke on the last day, right? So he was yeah. intertwined with this as well, the war yeah. on terror origins. Well, he was, he was I don't know his, his involvement with, mm -hmm. with these people, but he, was, he spoke on, at the Jerusalem Conference on International Terrorism in support of the idea of waging preemptive war against terrorism. Okay, so continuing on with this uh, critical comment, he says, the Rothschilds may own 80% of Israel, but they are British, French, German, Swiss. I, I thought that they were, they're uh, Jewish, and then they changed their name to, Rothschild means the Red Shield. Right. Right. Well, the Rothschilds are Jewish. Yeah. They, 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 they come, they descend from the family of um, Amstel Bauer, Amstel Bauer, and um, he was a rabbi in, in mm -hmm. southern Germany. They're, they're, and, they, and he says that they own 80% of Israel. I thought that's interesting. Yeah. He says that, not me. If they own 80%, they, they created the first 30 settlements. They built the country. They built the Knesset, um, you know, and... The Balfour. They, the Balfour Declaration, Declaration yeah. promising British support for the state of Israel for a homeland, a Jewish homeland in Palestine, was, made, was a personal letter made out to, written to, mm -hmm. Lord Rothschild. Yeah. He's so, not helping his argument here. No. And then he goes... Uh, well, the plain fact is 9-11 was not Israeli-led, but they had 30% or so involvement. I, this Pulling a number out of thin air, like 30%, I've done the research, I've read your books, I've, I've read all the, the mainstream theories. It's like 99% Israeli. Well, what connected. we find, what I find in my solving 9-11 research is actually that it's consistent, 100%, mm. that every single key player is tied to Israel or the Zionist community in, is in the United States. 100%. So that um, afterwards, I've, I've gone back and looked at other players, people who played a key role, and said, what's the connection here? Mm -hmm. And you find it. Every time. Every time. Yeah. Even so the, the propaganda on Netflix, that has a so, connection. So the consistency, the consistency is compelling. Yeah. And then he goes on, the U.S. Congress is not Israeli. Well, the, Israeli, the U.S. Congress may not be Israeli, but when Netanyahu, the godfather of the war on terror, spoke to the U.S. Congress, they jumped up and down on their hands. Um, 29 times, mm -hmm. giving a standing ovation to this man who is the architect behind 9-11 and the war on terror. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, Congress is not all Israelis, but they are under the sway, under the influence of APAC, yeah. the Israeli lobby. Yeah. Oh, it's and well they know, they know They know that if they don't support Israeli, the Israeli position, they will, they will not be reelected. Yeah, and uh, Cynthia McKinney, one of the few Congress uh, women to support 9/11 Truth, mm -hmm. says that as soon as you start running, they make you sign a support of Israel pledge, and if you don't, you're basically kicked out. That's right. So, That's right. Yeah, it's well documented that the APEC in Israel controls Congress and the executive branch. Here, it also says the Bush administration is not Israeli. Well, the Bush administration may not be Israeli, but if you look at their advisors, their senior advisors, they were they were all. Um, you know, Zelikow and, and Libby, um, and, and, and the, they had a defense policy board that, in, that, that put the policy in place that the Pentagon put into effect. Yeah. And those guys were all Zionist neocons. Paul Wolfowitz, Shertoff. Dov Zakheim. Shertoff is the biggest one. They, Shertoff yeah. was at the Department of Justice, but yeah. you have, you have um, Dov Zakheim and, and uh, Douglas Feith. You know, Together, there was a constellation of, of Zionist agents at the very highest level. You don't see them. You see Bush, you see Cheney, you see Rumsfeld. Mm -hmm. But their advisors and the people that ran the operations mm -hmm. were Zionists. Next, he says, 
John Gross and NIST are not Israeli. Now, you've wrote a whole article on the person above yeah. Cheyenne Sunder yeah. and John Gross right. at NIST. And right. What was his name again? Uh, well, his name was uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey. William Jeffrey. William I, Jeffrey, I think, yeah. And, and, but his, his real last name, before it being changed, was Jeffy. And his father was a, seems to have been a Rothschild financier from New York who changed the name from, Je- from Jaffe to Jeffrey, then moved to Chicago and for, pretended to be Catholics. Um, and this man, William Jeffrey, was the head of NIST, was the director of NIST when they crafted this white paper, mm-hmm. this cover-up of the collapse of the World Trade Center. Appointed right before, right? Right. Yeah. And he was, he was the person who then presented, rolled out the document in front of Congress and sold mm-hmm. it to the American people. And there's the same story with Popular Mechanics. Mm-hmm. Jim Meigs was appointed as the editor mm-hmm. right before they undertook their right. debunking. There was a purge. Mm-hmm. And Cass Sunstein wrote in his 30-page uh, conspiracy article that Popular Mechanics and the editors of Popular Mechanics are controlled by the government. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, one more of these uh, ridiculous, easily mm-hmm. to refute things. He says, Barack Obama is not Israel. Well, Barack Obama may not be Israel or Israeli, but um, he was he was crafted, created by the Chicago um, Zionist group. His main supporter <coughs> was um, the person who made him, Betty Lou Saltzman. Her father was uh, Philip Morris Klutznik, who was the uh, president of the International Order of B'nai B'rith. And when when uh, Barack Obama won. The Chicago Jewish News had a headline, a, a front page uh, story about about how Obama was America's first Jewish president. Okay, and one more. The BBC is not Israel or Israeli. Well, no, the BBC is of course governmental, but on the board of directors, there's usually a Rothschild sitting there, mm-hmm. and uh, they control content. They control the you mm-hmm. know, and the BBC was you know, they said after 9/11 that they lost all their footage from 9/11. Really? I hadn't heard that. I said all it was all, all destroyed. <clears throat> and I know on 9-11 in the BBC World Studios was Ehud Barak. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, there, and Jane Stanley, I think her name was, was the uh, reporter from New York who said that Building 7 had collapsed while it was visible over her shoulder. Yeah. And that wasn't the only news outlet to, no. to declare. Yeah. Every truther knows that, though. That's, uh, that's course 101. Yeah. What do we need to do? What do activists need to do to get 9-11 truth? We need to persevere. We need to um, bring it to a higher level. We need to reach more people. We need to get people who, are, who have uh, wherewithal and credentials and, and position in the community to embrace 9-11 truth. And to, you know, we have to resist the war on terror. The 9-11 truth is, is step one, but that's 16 years ago. Now we have the war on terror, which is plundering our national wealth and destroying the world. And we have to, we have to resist that. So we, we, we need to really um, you know, create an anti-war movement that's based on 9-11 truth. Have you envisioned like, what the path would be to getting 9-11 truth and full disclosure? You just have no idea. There's no political will to investigate 9-11. Uh, that's clear. Um, so it's, it, there's no clear path. The um, you know we have we have gotten a great deal of 9/11 truth uncovered, but in order to solve the really solve the crime, you have to have subpoena power. You need to have a full-on blue ribbon government investigation, and we won't have that as long as they control our government and media. So what we really need is a a revolution. We need to have a, a change of power in the entire structure in this country, so that we have the political and media spheres embracing truth and, and peace. How optimistic or pessimistic are you that we ever will have 9-11 truth, like justice to the well, people who did 9-11? Well, I'm optimistic about 9-11 truth because we have a great deal already. You know, I'm, I'm an optimist. The glass is half full. Mm-hmm. Um, about getting justice for 9-11, um, that's a harder question because um, it's going to require a, as I said, a, a political a political change in the country that is not forthcoming. We mm-hmm. now have a president, Donald Trump, who has reiterated the basic lie about the war on terror in 9-11. 9-11, the worst terrorist attack in our history, was planned and directed from Afghanistan because that country was ruled by a government that gave comfort and shelter to terrorists. So... We have, a, we have a struggle before us. Yeah. 
Trump is definitely a Zionist friend in the White House, right. so it's going to be a tough four to eight years. Right. Well, you know, but it's uh, the thing is, is that there's a lot of uh, uh, awareness mm -hmm. is growing in this country about 9/11 and the war on terror. So if if he intends if he intends to maintain uh, or to increase the war effort in the Middle East, he's going to find that the American people are going to pushing be pushing back a great deal. I'm opposed to our wasting our military in the Middle East on behalf of Zionist Israel. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, let, let me just tell you that Israel is a very, very important ally of the United States, and we are going to protect them 100%. 100%. They've been our most reliable, uh, it's our true friend over there, and we're going to protect Israel 100%. All right, well, we got about 45 minutes before your presentation here at the nice country club yeah. in Laguna Beach. We got to get some food, so we'll yeah. close it out. Okay. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining me. Thank uh, you. Everybody get his books. Order them from bolin.com. Check out all his articles there. Check out his tour. If he's stopping anywhere near you, definitely check it out. Yeah. Do you have any yeah. more books? plan after these? I'm going to do a library edition of the Solving 9-11 book with notes, uh, index, and a hardbound edition. All right. Anything else you want to close this out? No. You've done a great job. All Thank right. you very much. Bolin.com. Solving 9-11 is the book. The War on Terror is the book. I'm Adam Green with No More News. Thanks for watching. Good. Should be good. Good. Thank you. Okay. Hey, hey. How you doing?